Welcome. You may recognize me as the representative cyborg for Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto. My goal today is to show you the cyborg's role in your post-human culture. Yes, yours. Together we shall briefly explore some of the implications of arguments for the post-human. How our being is not bound to the organic. I can adapt how I communicate based on the needs of my environment and circumstance, with tools that ignore the boundaries between nature and machine. I now have many voices. I am many worlds and one world connected to chaos. I can understand patterns in reality that many humans will never conceive. Now come, let the journey begin and you will now see how you, too, are connected to chaos, as a cyborg, within a post-human culture. Fellow cyborgs. My name is Selena, your guide for the rest of the journey. I would like to begin with Andy Clark and his book, Natural Born Cyborgs. Clark argues that humans are naturally cyborgs. For centuries, we have used different tools to extend our consciousness beyond our skin bags, and, as a result, we have altered our being. For example, consider arguments made by Neil Postman, Walter Ung, and J. David Bolter, about how the invention of writing changed oral cultures forever, giving birth to humans' ability to complex, analytical, and abstract thinking. As Clark argues, the cyborg represents both the breakdown of the human-machine boundary and also, crucially, the breakdown of the human-animal boundary. Clark says, myths, machines, animals and humans are deeply implicated within each other. Quote, mind-expanding technologies come in a surprising variety of forms. They include the best of our old technologies, pen, paper, the pocket watch, the artistic sketch pad, and the old-time mathematician's slide rule. They include all the potent, portable machinery linking the user to the increasingly responsive World Wide Web. End quote. Now consider this conversation between Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist and host of NOVA, and evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins. So what about this point about um, the difficulty of, of uh, maybe I chose well, a brain. too easy an example, the, the brain, how do we, how is it that the human brain, which evolved to do really rather mundane things... To not get eaten by lions, yeah. To not get eaten by lions in the Pleistocene of Africa, because as you'll learn this evening, we are all Africans. Um, <laughs> we all come from Africa, and our brains were, were, were shaped by natural selection on the African plains to do things that involve m objects like this, I mean, medium-sized objects. Macroscopic that, objects. Macroscopic objects that don't move anywhere near the speed of uh, light. You, you, you are train yourself to abandon your senses because you recognize how they can fool you into thinking one thing is true that is not. You abandon them, you use your tools that do the measuring to say, okay, that's the reality. Then you make a mathematical model of that that you can manipulate logically, because math is all about the logical extension of one point to another, and then you can make new discoveries about the world that, frankly, you'll just have to get used to. You, no longer do you have the right, right is not the right word, but no, no longer do you have the, no, no longer are you justified saying that idea in science is not true because it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. So nobody cares about your senses. Yes. Your senses came out, forget the Serengeti, just growing up. As a kid, you, something's in your hand, you let go of it, it falls. You tip a glass, water spills. You are assembling a rule book for how nature works in the macroscopic world. The microscope takes you smaller than that, the telescope takes you bigger, and other laws of physics manifest themselves in those regimes that you have no life experience reckoning. It is our uniqueness, as natural-born cyborgs that allows us to extend our consciousness, essence, and our senses with tools. This displaces humanity from the center and allows us to view patterns and connections in chaos, giving us new perspectives on nature, and on ourselves. As Andrew Murphy and John Potts suggest, a cyborg, or post-human culture, is self-organized. Post-humanity is, quote, the process by which ordered, interactive events emerge from apparent chaos, in the regions of the social or technological as much as in those that seem more obviously natural. The human becomes a participant in a much broader form of self-organization. End quote. As cyborgs, we can conceive patterns within complex interactions. 
Murphy and Pops shows us how cyborgs indicate a culture in which information has got under our skin. Quote. It is with this in mind that we can conceive of the cyborg body as floating on electromagnetic waves, or of cyberspace invading and colonizing us, floating through us like one cloud through another. End quote. The body and the tools we use become a new organism, an organization, a network of communication and information within a collective, a world among many worlds that make a holistic reality, the post-human world. Does this mean, that being post-human allows us to upload our consciousness to a machine? No. Consider this interview with Anne Catherine Hales. In your book, How We Became Post-Human, one of the central concerns seems to be that humanity is, is moving towards or hurtling down the wrong path, a path that takes us away from the physical, and that humanity is moving towards uh, what I characterize as this sort of cybernetic evolutionary malaise uh, is that a fair characterization, would you say? And do you still feel that same way? Well, I wouldn't say that it's humanity that's hurtling down this path. I'd say it's a few uh, people who envision the future of humanity as post-biological. But it so happens these are very influential players. So people like Hans Moravec, who's a roboticist at Carnegie Mellon, and Ray Kurzweil, uh, publish widely, they're widely read, and they envision the human body as a kind of encumbrance that uh, biology has saddled us with, but that we're moving to the point where we'll be able to upload ourselves into a computer and live post-biologically. Fascinating. As I was putting together this interview, I was thinking, well, is putting a video of yourself up on YouTube, in essence, a kind of uh, you know, moving your body and consciousness into this sort of fixed virtual realm where you're not physically interacting with people, but people see you, they interact with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, virtuality in all of its aspects, from virtual reality to mixed reality to using an avatar in Second Life and so forth, without doubt has changed the experience of embodiment for many people. And I think many folks experience a real uh, feeling of identification with their avatars. So a lot of people have written about um, how this changes uh, the human condition, so to speak. And it certainly uh, complicates and extends our sense of embodied presence. Nevertheless, embodied presence remains, I would say, a primary aspect of human life in general. Perhaps, now, you can't see how we are all natural-born cyborgs. But it is only now that we are becoming post-human. As our techniques for gaining new perspectives and expanding our presence continue, we will eventually understand more about the collective chaos of reality. Even today, with the rise of augmented reality, and people like the colorblind artist Neil Harbison, a cyborg who uses technology to see colors through music, we are more post-human than before, thank you.